Let's talk about impulse and momentum when it comes to rigid bodies. Momentum can be broken into two parts, linear momentum and angular momentum. Since we have three broad groups for rigid bodies, let's go through finding momentum in each of these cases. When a rigid body is subjected to only translation, meaning it doesn't rotate, the linear momentum can be found by multiplying the mass by the velocity at the center of mass. Now since this object is going through translation, there is no angular velocity, which means angular momentum is zero. The next case is when a rigid body is rotating about a fixed axis. The linear momentum is the same as before, but now there is angular momentum. Angular momentum can be found by multiplying the mass moment of inertia by the angular velocity. So linear momentum is mass times velocity, and angular momentum is mass moment of inertia times angular velocity. Instead of finding the angular momentum at the center of mass, let's say we find it about point O. In this case, we can use this equation to figure it out. So the first part is the angular momentum about the center of mass, and then we add the second part, which is the perpendicular distance to the linear momentum vector times the linear momentum. These two added together gives us the angular momentum about point O. Lastly, we have general plane motion. In this case, the linear momentum is still the same, and if we find the angular momentum about the center of mass, it's also the same. If we find the momentum about a random point, however, then we can write it like this. Here, d is the perpendicular distance to the linear momentum vector, pretty similar to the rotation about a fixed axis. Now it's time to talk about impulse. Impulse can also be broken into two parts, linear impulse and angular impulse. Impulse, in simple terms, is how long a force is applied to an object for. So if we have an object like this, and we apply a 200 newton force for 5 seconds, the impulse is 200 newtons times 5 seconds. If the force is not a constant, then we integrate it from the initial time to the final time. Now for angular impulse. Instead of a linear force applied over a time period, what if it was a moment? For example, let's say we apply a moment like this for 5 seconds. Then the angular impulse can be found by integrating the moment from 0 seconds to 5 seconds. Now let's say we apply a 50 newton force that's 0.2 meters away from the center of mass. Let's also say we apply this force for 3 seconds. This force would create a moment about the center. We can then find the angular impulse by multiplying the force by the perpendicular distance multiplied by time. In other words, it's the moment created by the force multiplied by the time it was applied for. Now that we know what impulse and momentum is, we can write our principle of impulse and momentum equation. In fact, there are three such equations. The first is for x-axis forces. The second is for y-axis forces, and the last is the angular impulse and momentum equation. The first two equations state that the initial linear momentum plus the linear impulses added together would give us the final linear momentum. The third equation tells us that the initial angular momentum plus the sum of all the angular impulses would give us the final angular momentum. Before we do any examples, some questions will require you to find the mass moment of inertia. I show some equations here, but you can search online for all sorts of different objects. Also, keep in mind that if something is rotating about a fixed axis, we can figure out the velocity of that object by multiplying the distance by the angular velocity. If this is unfamiliar to you, please see the description for rigid bodies and rotation about a fixed axis. Now let's go over some examples step by step to see how we can use the equations we talked about. Let's look at this problem. We have a gear wheel that's placed on a rack. When we pull the rack with a 200 newton force, the wheel starts to spin. And we need to figure out how long it will take for the wheel to gain an angular velocity of 20 rads per second. Let's focus on the rack and draw a free body diagram. We have the weight, the normal force, the 200 newton force, and we also have the force applied at the center towards the left. This is the force that occurs with respect to the wheel that's spinning. To clarify this, let's also draw a free body diagram of the wheel. So we have the reactions at the pin, the weight, but we also have the same force, this time it's pointing to the right. 
so the force on the wheel with respect to the rack is pointing to the right, while the force on the rack with respect to the wheel is pointing to the left. This is what makes the wheel turn. Now using our free body diagram of the rack, let's write an impulse and momentum equation along the x-axis. We will pick right to be positive, but before we plug values in, we need to figure out the final velocity of the rack. So the question says we need the angular velocity of the gear wheel to be 20 rads per second. How fast does the rack need to move to give the wheel such a speed? Since the gear wheel is a rotation about a fixed axis, we can write the velocity at the point of contact, so point A, like this. The angular velocity is 20 rads per second and the radius is 0.15 meters. Solving tells us the required velocity at point A, which is also the required velocity of the rack to give the wheel an angular velocity of 20 rads per second. So again, the rack needs to move to the left at 3 meters per second to give the wheel an angular velocity of 20 rads per second. Now let's plug values in and then we will go over this equation. The initial momentum is zero since everything starts from rest. Then we have two impulses. Both of the impulse forces are constant, so we don't need to integrate anything. The first is the 200 Newton force which is applied for a period of time t. The same goes with force f but since it's pointing to the left, it's going to be negative. On the other side, we have the final momentum which is the mass of the rack times the final velocity which we found to be 3 meters per second. Let's simplify. So we have one equation with two unknowns, time and the force f. Let's write another equation. This time, however, it'll be an angular impulse and momentum equation, which is going to be about point O. So we're using the wheel for this part. We can write it expanded like this, where initial and final angular momentum is mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity. So to plug anything in, we actually need to find the mass moment of inertia about point O. And since the radius of gyration about point O is given, we can use this equation. The mass is 30 kilograms and the radius of gyration is 0.125 meters. Okay, so now, using the free body diagram of the wheel we drew before, let's plug values in. The initial angular momentum is zero since the wheel doesn't spin at the start. For the angular impulses, we only have one force that would create an angular impulse, which is force F. It's also a constant, which means we don't need to integrate anything. So remember, a moment is force times perpendicular distance. In our case, we have the force F times the perpendicular distance, which is 0.15 meters. And then we multiply it by time. On the other side, we have the mass moment of inertia times the final angular velocity, which is 20 rads per second given to us in the question. Now we have two equations with two unknowns. Solving them gives us our answer. So it took 0.61 seconds for the gear wheel to achieve an angular velocity of 20 rads per second. Let's take a look at this problem where we have two pulleys attached to each other. When the cord is pulled for 3 seconds with a force of 2000 newtons, we have to figure out the speed of the block. Let's draw a free body diagram of the pulleys. We have the reactions at pin O, the weight of the pulley, the 2000 newton force, and we have the weight of the block which is pulling downwards. We can solve this problem by writing an angular impulse and momentum equation about point O. Before we plug anything in, let's figure out the mass moment of inertia for the pulley. The mass is 15 kilograms and the radius of gyration is 0.110 meters. Now let's plug in the values and then go through the equation. The initial angular momentum is zero since everything starts from rest. Let's look at the angular impulses. We have the 2000 newton force times the perpendicular distance which is 0 0.075 meters and the time is 3 seconds. Remember, all the forces are applied for 3 seconds. Next, we have the weight of the block that also creates an angular impulse. Since this would make the pulley spin counterclockwise, it will be negative. We have the weight which is mass times acceleration due to gravity times the perpendicular distance which is 0.2 meters and lastly the time which is 3 seconds. Then we have the final angular momentum. Since this is a rotation about a fixed axis and there is a block we need to consider, we actually need to use the full equation for the angular momentum. The first part is simply the mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity. Then we add the perpendicular distance to point O times the mass of the block times its velocity. 
In other words, we're multiplying the perpendicular distance to the linear momentum vector times the linear momentum. So our equation actually has two unknowns. We need one more equation. There is a simple one we can use, which is this equation. The velocity of the block is equal to the radius of the pulley times the angular velocity, since again, this is a rotation about a fixed axis. Let's plug in the radius. We now have two equations with two unknowns. Let's solve them. So in 3 seconds, the block gained a speed of 24 meters per second. Let's take a look at this problem, where we have a torque applied to the shaft. When the shaft starts to spin, we need to find the angular velocity of the assembly after 3 seconds. When the shaft spins, link AB will have an angular momentum that is clockwise, and the same is true for link BC. So we will need to consider both of these angular momentums. Let's write an equation for angular impulse and momentum. It will be about the z-axis, since that's the axis of rotation for the rods. I will also write the expanded form of angular momentum. So we need a few things. First, we need the mass moment of inertia for the rods, and it will be about the center of mass. For that, we can use this equation. The mass is 9 kilograms and the length is 1 meter. We also need the distance from the center of mass to the shaft. If we use a top-down view like this, you can see that this is the radius of the circle that each of the rods would create when spinning. Remember, each of the rods is going through rotation about a fixed axis. So let's calculate the distances. For rod AB, it's just 0.5 meters. For rod BC, we need to use the Pythagorean theorem. Notice that one side of the triangle is 1 meter, while the other side is 0.5 meters. So the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle is the distance from the center of the mass to the shaft. Ok, now we can start plugging values in. Let's go through this equation. So initially, everything starts from rest. So the initial angular momentum is 0. For the angular impulse, our torque is not a constant, which means we do need to integrate. Our time starts from 0 seconds, so that's our lower bound, and we're calculating everything at 3 seconds, which means that's our upper bound. On the other side, we have the angular momentums. We need to consider the angular momentum of both rods. We're using the full equation. First, for rod AB, we have the mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity of the rod. Then we add the distance to the shaft multiplied by the mass multiplied by the velocity at the center of mass. This velocity is the velocity of the rod AB at the center of mass. This is not angular velocity. That completes the part of rod AB, so now we need to account for rod CB. Again, we have the mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity of the rod. Then we add the distance from the center of mass of rod BC to the shaft, multiplied by the mass of the rod, multiplied by the velocity of rod BC at the center of mass. Now because each of the rods are rotations about a fixed axis, we can write the velocity at the center of mass in terms of angular velocity. Remember, velocity when it's a rotation about a fixed axis is angular velocity times the distance to the rotation axis. In our case, it's the radii we calculated before. By doing this, we can figure out the angular velocity of the assembly since that is constant for each rod. So the angular velocity is the same, but the velocity at the center of mass for each rod is different. Now let's substitute these velocities into our equation. Now we can solve for angular velocity. So the angular velocity of the assembly is 9 rads per second. That should cover the types of problems you will face when it comes to angular impulse and momentum. I hope this video helped you, and if it did, please consider sharing it with your friends and classmates. They too might find it helpful. Thanks for watching and best of luck with your studies.